So let's see if it works. And if it doesn't, I'll just read it out. Okay? The Word of God is the Word of God. Okay? I think something's coming up. I see some light. I see something green. Okay. Great. Today's scripture, let's all stand up. Is Second Kings chapter five, verses one through fourteen. Today's story is a great story. You guys are all gonna really like it, okay? Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shackles of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him. Okay. I'll read the rest. You guys can sit down. But when Elijah, the man of God, heard that king of Israel had torn his clothes, he said to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elijah sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure this leper. I'm not Ebana, and far apart, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. But his servant came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Would you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Okay. How many of you know this story? Okay, wow. Okay, I guess it's a popular story. Today's story, the section, the title under... Over today's section is Naaman healed of leprosy. Okay? Naaman healed of leprosy. So today I wanted to talk to you about how this healing came around. About this miracle of getting leprosy cured. Of course, this is done by God, right? It's a miracle by God. So did God just go to Naaman and say, Hey, Naaman, I'm going to cure you. Did he say that? 
They say, hey, you're suffering, right? I know. You're a good guy. I'm going to cure you. Is that what he did? No, that's not what he did. God did no such thing. So how was Naaman healed? What were the events that took place? Who are the people that were, that were involved? How did the process of healing begin? Who initiated the healing? Anybody? Anybody? Who started the whole process? Anybody? Yes. Okay, a young servant girl. This huge miracle was started by who? A young servant girl. This young servant girl from Israel tells Naaman's wife that there is a prophet in Israel who could cure him of his leprosy. If she didn't say this, would Naaman have been cured? No. He would have just lived and just did what he did. So, this spectacular miracle would have not have happened without this young servant girl from Israel. Surprising, right? Now, let's think about this. Jew, if you live with your parents, and some people invaded this country and took you by force. Oh, yeah. Took you away from your Anni, took you away from your mom and dad, brought you. Now you're a slave. You're a servant. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> now you get to do the rest of your life just doing whatever somebody, what this pe person tells you to do. Would you have told this person about a prophet who could heal? No. What am I going to do? Oh, my life is ruined. I'm a slave. At a young age. Young girl. This is a young girl at that age. Which means they're about your age. Young girl. About your age. They're taken. They're slaves. They, they go in. Okay, now, she's one of the many, many, many servants there who's serving who? This woman. Giving her bath water, getting her food, cleaning the house, whatever she was doing. Would you go out of your way to tell your mistress about this servant, or about this prophet? No. So, why did she do that? You know, you're a slave. <laughs> that is a, not a good thing, right? That's not a good thing. I mean, your destiny is set. You just do things until you die, right? Is there any ambition in life? Maybe to be a higher slave, I don't know. Would you tell your master about this prophet? But this young girl did. Why did she do that? All the young girls in the house. Why would you tell your mistress about somebody who could kill her husband of leprosy? Why? James? <laughs> if, I, if I were a young girl, I would have said it so that I would get rewarded later. Okay. You could have said, okay, I'm telling this because if maybe he gets healed, I'm going to get rewarded, right? Maybe I won't be a slave anymore. But then, you have to think about this. Hmm. This prophet, I heard about him. I never seen him in action. I tell my mistress, my owner, and she tells her husband, and he actually goes there 
But who has heard of leprosy being cured? What if he doesn't get cured? What's going to happen to me? <laughs> I'm going to die. Right? You could have said she did it for her reward. But then, if you actually thought about this, if he didn't get cured, what's the, do you think there's a greater chance that he's going to get cured or not be cured? Not be cured, right? I mean, 문득병을 낫게 하는 게 누가 들어보지도 못한 거야 이거. So, I don't think it was because of the reward, because the risk far outweighs the reward. Reward is okay. She might just go up on the slavery hierarchy. She's a head slave, but she's young anyways. But then the the risk is she could lose her life. She could be tortured. But she still told the mistress about this prophet. Why? Anybody? Why? She had to have what? Anybody? Bora, why would you tell your mistress about this chance to get healed? You don't know? I think because she actually loved the mistress. I mean, I, you know, I thought about this for a long time. There is no other possibility. She loved her mistress. Why? Because she probably treated her like, not like a slave, but took care of her, had compassion on her, and was nice to her. Think about it. When she came, she, when she was being, you know, she's got this thing and she's being led to another country, all these things might, probably went through her head. What if I get a really big, ugly, really mean guy as my master? What's going to happen to me? But after she came here, she got this, came into this house, and this mistress, all of a sudden, you, you're living in fear, and in this fear, you meet this person who's going to be your master and find out this person is actually really nice and really loving and is taking care of you. So what do you want to do? But she has one big, big problem that's making her really, really sad. That's her husband has leprosy, which means she can't even talk, touch him anymore because she's going to get leprosy too. I'm sure they are living in maybe different house, definitely different rooms that he can't, she can't go close to her, her husband. It's filling her with sadness and this girl wants her mistress to be happy. That's the only reason that I saw. She could just took their mouth set, here's the water. So what do you want now? Okay, let me go get that. What do you want now? Okay. It's 10 o'clock, can I sleep? Okay, thank you. She could have did that, but she didn't do that. Okay, I'm glad somebody's having a good time. <laughs> I think... I think this young servant girl told her mistress because she was kind, she was compassionate, she was loving. And then what happened? So, she tells her mistress. Now you're the mistress. Okay. Let's see. Hidden in you. You're the mistress of the house. Your husband is the great general, great commander of the army kicking everybody's butt. <laughs> you have all this servant, and this young servant girl comes and says, you know what? I know somebody could heal your husband. In Israel, there's a prophet who could heal your husband. What would you do? Oh, fantastic, let's go. Would you say that? Would you say that? Let's think about this. Mini Hamin. Let's say you were married, and he's a very Great general. He's respected by everyone, even the king. And this little girl comes and says, you know what, there's a person who could save you. Would you say, oh, fantastic, let's go. 
It'd be very hard. One, she was young. You may say, hey, thank you for that mentioning, but I don't think you know the serious of leprosy. <laughs> leprosy is not that easy to cure. Second of all, this little country called Israel, who's weaker than us, you could tell by the re reaction of King of Israel when she when we got that letter, right? Oh no, they're trying to come up with some excuse to come and invade us and destroy us and make us all his slaves. And he's like ripping his clothes. And, ah! That shows immediately that that this country is not stronger than Israel, right? Oh, there's a small little dinky country over there. And then there, there's a prophet. She was not only young, but at that time, she was, she was a slave. And she was slave from this, this Chongnara, this small little country. For mistress, it would have been very hard to believe her and act on that. But she did. Why? Because she was desperate? I don't think so. I think Naaman, you know, he's the greatest commander of that whole country. I'm sure he went to the best doctors. I'm sure he went to everywhere that he ever heard. Somebody, you know, there's that rich society of people. You know what? That doctor's really good over there. Okay, we'll go. I'm sure he must have tried every single thing possible to get well. And nothing worked. This little girl says something, and she actually believes her. Why? I mean, why would you believe a servant girl like that? <laughs> it's just speculation. We don't know for sure. You know, I think there's two reasons why. First of all, she must have been trustworthy, right? Like Yonu. Don't ask me this question. You know, so is Jiu trustworthy? I'm sure you're gonna say yes. So whatever Jiu Jiu will tell, well, oh yeah, I trust her hundred percent. Whatever she said, it's gotta be right. Just because I've seen the way she lived and how she did all these things, she's so trustworthy. Because if she wasn't, if she told her mistress that she wouldn't have believed her, right? So this girl was not only a very nice person, but she was very trustworthy. Number two, I believe because God also moved her heart, the mistress' heart. She actually believed. Okay, there's mistress. Who's next? Naaman's wife, her. Now, what does she have to do? What does she have to do? Yeah, convince your husband. You want to help me? Come here, sit down for a minute. You know what? I think you can get cured. Name of You know what? I went to every single doctor. I went to every single witch doctor out there. Who has heard of being healed of leprosy? Who told you? Is it some really great prophet? Is it some magician? Was it some really wise man from the East? No, my young... Slave girl from Israel. <laughs> you crazy? He could have said that, right? But he didn't. Because, I'm sure, because he trusted his wife too. If you, if you trust her, I trust her. If you think it's worthwhile, okay, let's go. All of this relationship is trust. Now, who's next on the list? Okay, Naaman hurts, hears from his wife, and what does he do now? Who does he have to convince? Okay. The king. Now, Daniel, teacher, you're the king. You have all, I mean, you're the, the king, you're the man. Everybody, you walk, everybody, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then your commander comes up to you and says, you know what? This little young Servant told me that there's this prophet in that small, dinky little country in Israel who could heal me. What would the king would have said? If it was a Korean king, 
고려시대, 백제시대, 신라시대, 킹. Why was that king sent to this general? 정신 차려. <웃음> you are a general. You are commander in my army. What's wrong with you? What was his soldiers think? Oh man, he finally cracked. <laughs> He's gonna bleed himself, little girl, and go somewhere. You know, if I think of myself as Naaman, it will be very hard to tell the king, it's especially in front of all my troops. It's gonna make me seem like I'm <clears throat> desperate, not like, not manly, not macho. This is not a macho thing to do. If I'm macho, I'm just gonna die in my leprosy. I'm gonna fight for you to the end. And I'm just going to go down in the flames of fire. Macho man. <laughs> but this general was not a macho man. This general went and said, you know what, There's this, this girl told me somebody could heal me. King is incredible too. Yeah? Okay. Not only can you go, here's a bunch of gold, here's a bunch of silver, and let me write to this letter. You could go with an entourage of people. You could just help take the whole army with you, basically. There's a, basically, he's not going as a person of Naaman. He's going as the person who the king sent, right? That's got some power. You're going in your chariot. You're going in there as a, as a victor, right? Everybody's afraid of you. So this king, now, who's next? This king sent him, who's next? Did the king of Israel say, oh, there's a prophet here, go talk to him. Is that what he said? No, what did the king do? Oh my God, I'm going to die. That's what the king said. Who was the next person? It was Elijah, right? Elijah the prophet. He heard what happened and said, you know, why are you crying like a little girl? Send him to me. I'll take care of him. He could have said, you know what, he's a general from my enemy country. Let him die as a leper, I don't care. In fact, let me speed it up. God, just faster. <laughs> Make him suffer more and more and more. Just just all the way through the bones. But he didn't do that. Let him come. So, Elijah sends for him. Okay, now, imagine yourself. You're Naaman. You have hope now, right? You're going down. You talk to the king. You go into the prophet. And you're filled with hope. All these people. All this process. And you find it here. And you have all this idea. And you can tell by what we read. What he expected. He expected what they meant to come and wave his hand, stand and call upon the name of the Lord. Shh. And something big, mystical, fantastic, spectacular thing happened and shh, he's healed. That's what he was expecting, right? That's what he was expecting. Something like a blockbuster movie. That's what he was expecting. I'm, I'm sure he was going, I wonder what he's going to do. I wonder how he's going to cure me. He's going to put something over me. It's like a light going to shine from heaven. How am I going to be healed? And he gets to the house and he's faced with something totally unexpected. The prophet doesn't come out. The prophet sends his servant. To say, hey, go dunk yourself in the river seven times. Now, what does the Bible say? He was furious. He was enraged. He was angry. Does he know who I am? That's what it says. Does he know who I am? Does he play me for a fool? Is he going to ridicule me in front of everybody, in front of my, my soldiers? Is that what he's trying to do? I'm going to go down to this dirty river, this cleaner river where I came from. And go into the waters, not once, <coughs> but seven times? He was furious. But you see the character of Naaman. 
Now, James, if you're Naaman, you have a whole army, and there's going to be nobody in that country who's going to resist you. You are, even the king, like, oh, you front of this house already. And, it's, and he sends his servant, what, what would you do? If it was me, I'd be like, go drag that guy out. Make him kneel in front of me. Let me take my sword, and let's see if he still tells me to go dunk myself in the river seven times, right? That's what normal guys who's got a lot of power would do. You display your power. Oh yeah? Say it to my face. You want me to do, make a fool of myself? Say it to my face. But he didn't do that. Even though he was enraged, he politely ran away. That shows the character of Naaman. I don't know how many of us have that. I don't know if it was Daniel or Nathan or Jimmy. I don't know if they'll be able to control their anger like that in that situation. But he politely left without harming Elijah. And then who was next? Who was still furious? Who, who actually made him do it? Who? Did you all of a sudden think, oh, maybe I should go in there? Is that what, it, what happened? How many of you remember what I just read? Who helped Naaman actually get into the river and dunk himself seven times? Yeah, his servant. Wow, there's so many people involved in the story. So Naaman is furious. And Naaman's servant comes and he tells Naaman this, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? How much more when he tells you, wash and be clean? Now, if you're a servant, would you dare confront your master when he was this angry? Bible tells us he was in a rage. It's not just anger. He's raging. Yeah! Your master? Just do it. <laughs> What's the big problem? Just get into the water. He said, don't want to just go in my <laughs> This servant, what happened? He risked his life, telling Naaman, right? He risked his life. Why would he do that? Why would he risk his life? Isaac, why would he risk his life? Any, any insight? Why would the servant, you know, the master is really upset, but still goes and tells them, why would he risk his life? God moved his heart. Okay, God moved his heart. And also, I think because the servant actually loved the master, too. Because without love, you can't risk your life. Trust me. Would I risk my life for my son? Of course, because I love him. Would I risk my life for some homeless guy on the street? As a Christian, yes, I should. Would it be very difficult? Yes, because I have no love for that person at that particular moment. At this particular time, Naaman's servant risk his, risks his life, even, his, even though his mask is like, how dare you? How dare you ask me to embarrass myself in front of my whole army? Even though he could say, well, take that servant and why don't you just drown him in that water? Even with that risk, servant still went to the master. He said, Master, if the prophet told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? If he told you to climb that cliff and get that, get that little plant that's up there and if you eat it, you'd be well, wouldn't you have done that? Why don't you do it? Wow. Now that takes some guts. That takes some courage. And the next, again, is Naaman. His humbleness. He says, he's fuming. His servant tells him something, and he actually says, okay, let me diffuse myself. Let me go down to the water. 
Naaman is no ordinary man. This man is a humble, loving, compassionate. He is, he is a great man. No wonder God chose him. He listened to his servant in the middle of his enragement. When you're really angry, Jeongdim, it's hard to even listen to your wife. Daniel probably knew that too. If, if I'm really mad about something and my wife is ng -ng 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 something, it's really hard for me to listen to my wife at that moment. But to say, okay, wife, you're right. I should not be angry. Let me just do it like that. Well, wow, actually, that takes a man. All right? <laughs> that takes a man, right? Naaman did it. He went and he dunked himself. Not once, not twice, not three times. How many times? Seven times. How many of you were baptized? You know, when you went into the water, how did you feel? First time I got baptized, I got baptized several times. First time, I didn't really know what it meant. I just did. Nobody told me I had to hold my nose. You know, and so when I actually went baptized, all this water went up my nose, and you know, my pastor brought me up, and I'm like, you know, the whole thing is coming out of the nose, and, and I'm, I'm, I got tears coming down my eyes, and you know, think about this, and Naaman is not in a bathtub, he's where? In a river, where there should be like algae, he's in all these other green muck in there. Okay, so he's in there seven times, dunking himself. When he comes out the seventh time, what happened? He's healed. Not only is he healed, he has some baby skin. Skin of a baby. That's what all women want. Skin of a kid. <laughs> baby, baby skin. You know? He comes out and he is totally regenerated. He's totally what? He's born again. He's got a baby skin. God does something not only to meet it, he goes beyond, to the ultimate, to the maximum. God works the miracle and blesses him. So, in order to experience this miracle, how many people were involved? Young girl, young servant girl, name is wife, name and name is king, Elijah, Elijah's servant. But above all of this, the entire miracle was possible because God willed it. It's God who gave Naaman the victory. It's God who had worked through Elijah and Elisha to make a reputation so the little young girl would know that there's a prophet in, in, in Israel who does this kind of a miracle. It was God who directed Elijah to tell Naaman to dip himself into the water seven times. It was God who cured Naaman of his miracle, of, of his leprosy. Not only that, this entire process was possible because of the kindness and humbleness of Naaman and his wife. Because of their kindness and their love, their servants risked their life. Do you want to experience miracle in your life? How many of you sometimes pray for a miracle in your life? Just from today's story. Don't expect God to say, okay, here's your miracle. Whatever you want, zap. In this mysterious, spectacular way. Don't expect that. What did Naaman have to do to be blessed with the miracle? He lived his life in kindness, in love, in compassion, and in humbleness. Every day, that's how he lived. Not only to his king, not only to his fellow soldiers, hey, we're, you know. But he was like that. She, even his wife was like that. Even to the young servant girls. Understand? You want miracle in your life? First, you have to be that kind of a person. Okay? Second of all, God works through people around you circumstances around you. You have to be open. 
you have to have the credibility, trustworthiness, so somebody would tell you about certain things, would suggest certain things, and you have to be meek enough to take it. Trustworthy. Don't let your tempers and emotions control you. Sometimes your temper gets the better part of you. Because of your temper, you miss opportunities. You say something you shouldn't have said. Don't let your temper, like Naaman, control himself and humble himself in the middle of his rage. Lastly, I want to reiterate one more time. You have to be humble. Don't think that you know best. Don't think that you know better than somebody else. Don't be conceited. So you don't listen to everybody else, but just think that you do whatever you want to do. You're not as smart, you're not as wise as you think. You have to put your ears to the young slave girls, what she says. Older brothers and sisters, you have to listen to younger brothers and sisters sometimes too. I not only listen to my wife, I listen to my son. Sometimes from the mouth of my small, not small, big, big little young kid comes some wisdom. I'm not considering nothing. Daniel, just be quiet over there. I li you know, you say something, I say, you know what, you're right. Humbleness. As I close, I want to close with this. All of us, we could experience God's miracle. You have to be humble. You have to be kind. You have to be loving. You have to be trustworthy people. And you have to listen for God. How do you listen for, for God? You have to do your quiet times. There's no way you could recognize God's voice if you never talk to God. How do you know His voice? You read the Word of God, you pray, every single day you spend time with God, and what happens? You get familiar with the voice of God. You are familiar with the way God acts. As I, you recognize that's from God. I might not have trusted that little girl, but I trusted the God behind that little girl. Okay? Let's all close our eyes. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. You are the Almighty God back then, and you are the Almighty God now. You worked miracles back then, and you can work miracles right now and in our lives. I pray that we could be that kind of a person who that miracle could happen. That we would be a loving person, be a kind person, be a considerate person, be a humble person, be a trustworthy person, and we would not be conceited. We would listen to people around us and we would know your voice by spending time with you. I pray that we would all stand firm in doing our, our QT every single day and spending time with you. I pray that you would strengthen us, give us the determination to do it and work miracles in our lives so we could have testimony of that which will help us to spread your word. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. amen.